we welcome everybody tuning in today because today is about to be one of the more epic combat battles in this year a rematch between none other than dustin poirier versus conor mcgregor it's about to go down but before i get started i'd like to introduce myself for those of you who have never watched this channel boy you are late to the dance my name is eric a bradley aka it's about to go down on a fight show but we do have a special guest for those of you who never known about what we do we break the fight world down round by round from the inside of the sport because i am 30 years plus in this thing and i love to bring the true essence of the sport to you so today our guest is none other than the son and champion dia davis son of olympic great howard davis the greatest amateur boxer to ever lace him up in the toughest olympic year to medal 1976 he was outstanding fighter so you understand the lineage in which dustin poirier is under right now and today we're going to have him on the show but before we get going we just wanted to warm you up because when he joins in this feed you're going to hear some great conversation it's going to be one of the things that we wanted to always do is eye open open your eyes and give you the ability to see the combat world from within not the stuff that the media gives you when you pop over here on all of the networks and they're just talking and these people don't understand the sport it's not their fault but behind the closed doors in the world of combat it's a lot different than what you guys are used to hearing and when you see this show our focus is to make sure you get the effervescence and the essence of what really goes down the conversations how they really happen the real side the struggle inside of the struggles and that's what you're going to hear a little bit of today as we chop it up and break it down 80 percent of the show was about the man himself and the other 20 percent was about what is that ingredient that you have to have whenever you're in the fight game at this level so you'll hear a little bit about that we don't ask who do you think you're gonna win do you feel like you're gonna win what round you well, that's not us man we're not media so i hope you guys are really to take a a, a very high leap into the game right now for those of you who are tuning in for the first time if you like really getting great commentating and conversations because we don't really get into interviews we basically chop it up here uh it's sort of like one of the realest conversations you're gonna have so when we talk to our people we're gonna go right into the real stuff we don't goof off and play around so with no further ado we're about to get it popping and we're gonna jump right into a conversation fight chat that we had and it really alluded to some of the journey that got Daya to this place to ever be able to be in the corner and when you hear these stories they really break down the essence of what it takes to do this at a very high level so i hope you guys are really ready for the for the ride that we're about to give you the next half hour you'll really be able to take some stuff in and at the end, please stay tuned because we got some good stuff here and we're going to continue to break it off for you. At the end of the show, we'll ask that you, if you enjoyed yourself, make sure you subscribe because there's a bundle of other content uh, looting from this show that you will get to hear. And we'll really give you a much better perspective about the combat game at its highest level. All right. So here we go. On to the show as we enter into the third quarter of the conversation. So enjoy. One of the things that when I say that, ask that question, it takes me back to when we was traveling back and forth up to Baltimore. And once again, being baptized by fire, being put on the larger stages. So Hassan Rockman was in a fight, getting ready to fight Klitschko. 
And that was, of course, one of the guys you saw. And you said, yeah, I can I can do this when you oh. saw Pitch going Linux, right? right? Well, another story to add on to this, uh, there was a fighter. His name was Beast, Brandon Cabell out of Baltimore. You can pull him up. Uh, and he was on the Coach Tyrone Soul up there, Barry Hunter, up there near Barry Hunter and them up in D.C. Yeah. But he was in Baltimore. So right. we used to go up there and help them out. And Rock was like, yeah, I want Beast. Beast grew up in Baltimore, but he had moved down to, to, to Carolina to get to work and kind of change his atmosphere, give himself right. the best chances. So I put him up under my wing. Coach Bradley was like, he had a lot of guys under his wing. And he just was like, yo, so Beast kind of melted under me. Beast was six foot seven, 265, oh. shoes oh. off. He could go. 15 rounds, leave the gym, combat boots on, and do 15 miles. True story. I got it on video. I videoed everything for the history books. He was prepping to get Hasim Rockman ready. You're going to love this story. Hasim Rockman. He said, yo, coach, every time that dude get me in the gym, he right. said, they grew up together. So they grew up in the same part of Baltimore. You know, you know, Hasim Rockman, hands like this, head yeah. like this. Hasim Rock, yeah. He said, yo, he said, every time he get me in there, coach, he say, yo, what's up, beast, man? How you doing, boy? Everybody good? How the family? Yeah, yeah. He said, the bell ring. He said, boom. Every <laughs> time. He said, yo, he tried to detach my head. He, oh, he pulled my guard down with all oh, that man. nice talk. That's family. Yeah, <laughs> okay, right? Okay. Yo, he was like, yo, he said, coach. I said, look, man, I'm gonna tell you what to do. You know, soon as he start talking to you, just ice grill him, you know, be wrapping your hands and just be getting your stuff ready. And then right. just be like, yeah, I was like, yo, so what's good with you? I said, always return the conversation with the first thought in mind, be first. And I told him a lot of different wrinkles which he loved that. He loved that. He'd been taught how to box. Coach right. Ty Tyrone Soul couldn't have taught him better how to be a pure boxer. Hands up at all times. Long, steady jab. Six mm. foot seven. He was bigger than Klitschko. Yeah. He was like, yo, shoulders broad, crazy. I mean, insane, just a freak of nature. He was eight and two at the current, eight and one. And He'd only lost because, like, at the very first fight or second fight, he, he lost a decision for a round fight. That can happen. But, right, he, right. but Coach So got him in the boom, got him just nice. And he came and I said, Look, we're going to teach you some different things. So just add some wrinkles because right. you're fighting professional fighters. And he right. didn't have an extensive amateur career either. So he got in there, man, and he felt right. confident. He said, uh, Yeah, the only thing he does, though, he always pulled my guards down. And look, I'm going to tell you, and you know this kind of experience, because I know your dad unleashed the chain every once in a while to let you go and bite. Mm -hmm. Yo, I was running late to get there. We was in traffic on 395 going to Baltimore. <laughs> got there. When I got there, man, they was, I mean, they was knuckled. I mean, it was like, rah, rah. I mean, all you could hear the grunts. And I was like, oh, and I walked in and he looked over. And he tilted his head, and they had one more round to go. Man, he was body head, rock, rock. And we had just worked the body head back right. to the body left hook. Right. Man, that for four rounds of this, four rounds. He, yo, the bell run beast was like, next. Like, yo, he was next. like, he walked over the beast. He took the mouthpiece. He's like, damn, beast, you tried to get me. <laughs> he was like, nah, man. You know, and they got that Baltimore accent. So he's like, nah, dude. <laughs> you know, oh, man, I won't go let you get me. Yo, man, I was so proud of him, man. He, yeah. Rock was in such a good shape. I mean, he was in the gym working, man. And we was in the uh, ESPN zone with Larry Merchant, Jim Lampley. Cats was wild. And now he had a wild crew of dudes surrounding him. So after that, that same, like the, the day after that next day, so it was like a day and a half later. Right, here, right. Goes, here goes the call, diet. Guess what happened? What? Fitzko pulls out. Oh. He had spies, and he saw that Rock was getting 
work, like right, right. real, real work, his knee. And he retired the first time. Vitaly Klitschko, that is. True story, man. And right. he make wow. it up. No, the 24 7, the countdown series had already came out. I mean, so, it was a week away from like a week away. or after the fight with Lennox. It was right after. Right it after. Was right after. Like that was just like 2006. He fought Lennox. The first, no, it was first, 2007. The it, was the, it was the very next opportunity to okay. fight, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And Lennox, you know, of course, Lennox said, Yeah, I'm good with this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm out of here. You know yeah. what I'm saying? And it was smart because, you know, yo, you ain't got nothing else to prove. Yeah. These guys are new, younger guys coming in. And that's why I said, man, we're going to chop it up, Doc. But that man, to hear them boys hitting each other, man, I, you talking about something special. Man, I got some footage on video, man, that would just, it's pay per view sparring. I mean, <laughs> I, and I never get rid of myself. I, I got them on VHS tapes, Doc. Yeah, so, dude, I got oh. my stuff on VHS that I need to convert to yeah. either deep or digital. Ugh. Yeah, get but it you done. Know what? Like, it was sparring is very important, man. I, and I had the opportunity to work with a lot of yeah. high-level quality names, man. Yeah, yeah. Um, Within my first year, I was already sparring with Bernard Hopkins. I helped him get ready for <sighs> first fight with Jermaine Taylor. And I mean... I was you know, so pissed. I, I was again, he, he beat so, Jermaine Taylor, and I was just like, "Wow, why do they do that?" Yeah, man. I wow. mean, my game so much from watching it was just like going to school every day. You know, you know, wow. I went from I went from being his chief spawn partner. I was young. I was you know I was a lot younger than Bihar. Bihar was probably in the late thirties. Yeah, I was maybe twenty again, twenty six, maybe twenty seven. Uh -huh. Yeah, <sighs> and I was kind of working Bihar a little bit, man. So, <laughs> I went from chief spawn partner to, for, to doing six rounds to uh, we're only going to use you for four rounds today to uh, we just need you for two rounds today and we're going to have these other guys pick yeah. up on it. Yeah. But it was an amazing experience. So, you know, even when I was, I do my couple of rounds and I go out and I sit out, I'm, it was like university for me. I'm watching him work with other dudes, and shoulder rolling and slipping and countering. I'm like, man. Beautiful magic, ain't it? So crafty. So great. Man, such a great technician oh, and was able amazing. to not get emotional in the ring. And and I always said this, Daya, that people, too, you know, Bowie Fisher, Bowie Fisher uh, was brilliant. God bless his soul. You know, he was there yeah, at the time. He was the man. I seen Richard, God, God bless his soul. He was also there at the time. Not him. The knowledge that guys were just spitting out, man. I'm just, I'm just lineage. Looking. Wow. That lineage, man. And then, isn't it funny when you hear those phrases and 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 that conversation that you never heard before, the stuff that they talk about you should be doing, and mm. just you hearing stuff for the first time. Now that's the thing about me. When I hear some things and I hear some about techniques and and wrinkles, man, I gotta put my student hat on. And over thirty years of doing that, you know, I have accrued a vast library of some amazing things, man, under the tutelage and played the role that was necessary for me to play, to be at the level in which I do and aid others in doing. Cause when you see somebody like Bernard Hopkins, the things that he knew, like when he said to Kelly Pavlik, man, he looked real good with those guys in the ring, man. He's doing some real good work. Him and Nassim, they was like, let's see what happens when the angles change. Woo, man. <laughs> he was something else with his words, man. Woo. Let's see what happened. Women and not, women and not getting wet. Oh, my gosh, yo. That dude, just the, 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 just the prowess inside of that ring and just the mental fortitude to do it and control his, his emotions and to get under the other guy's skin. And that's right. sometimes what you have to know how to do if you need a little more help. Is mm -hmm. to get up under the other guy's skin. And right. if that guy's prep now, it's it's a little harder to do that. But you know what? As I thought about this, I see your father being an out the outstanding Olympian in, in his career, which is man, it's so many it's such a hand, it's only a handful of dudes that got that, you know, that's a thing that you can never change. The right. history books, that means you're in American soil. In right. the best country 
where boxing is Bible, your dad, in the toughest year of the Olympics, in the greatest Olympic team, wears that crown, the MVP. So as I look back at his, his career, man, and Camacho used to train at our gym. Right. One of my younger fighters put him on his butt one day. He didn't like that. Victor Andre shouts out to Victor. And um, Camacho took him under his arm, and he knew. When I think about Camacho was coming to the end of his career, let's not get it twisted. Young Camacho yeah. would have blasted him. You know what I'm saying? Right. This was a young kid who was really skilled, but you know he ain't on that level, never allowed right. him to get there. But he right. had the ability. But Camacho, when I saw the fight with your father and him, I kind of see that matchup sort of like the matchup that you guys have the weekend, you know, someone who has an ability to counter right. punch really well. And I always tell guys this, every coach has skills. Every coach knows a lot of tech. Most know a lot of techniques, mm -hmm. but it's a minute I mean, you can put the amount of people that really understand this other part section of the game, you can put them on the, the, the head of a needle. Right. The people that can identify what you can do in the in a in a scenario where the trouble is at. Mm -hmm. The trouble where the trouble is at when it's happening. And mm -hmm. one of the skill sets that I developed is the first times I was by ringside, the game was moving at such a pace in a Speed when you got elite, the elitists of athletes, and I'm talking to all of you guys who will be watching this thing on Saturday night. Specifically, it's not like watching it on your couch, and it's not like watching it from the stands. The warp speed of the most supreme athletes in the Happening. world, the game goes at an entirely different speed. Milliseconds, brother. Milliseconds, and you have to not only see, you have to retain mm -hmm. that moment in which your fighter right. need to know what happened, especially sometimes they get clipped and it happened in a combination of punches and it might not even be angled at you. How do you adapt that? How do you make that adjustment? What do you tell your guy? How do you tell them? Not what, how, how is right. the brain able to receive it? So I became what they call the whisperer, understanding the tone in which you got to talk this time, this round, not, <laughs> how you do it all the time and that's right. a skill that it, you can't really teach so how to simplify things when he gets to a point where you can explain it to the fighter and i'm sure your dad talked to you because he was in such a, a circle of killers that he understood once he was able to be a fighter that he understood another wrinkle was to be able to speak to your fighter mm -hmm. as a trainer and sometimes when elite fighters go from amateur to pros they don't have that necessary voice to aid them because they know what to do when they hear it or if they were in the situation but yes sometimes you can't express it like it needs you to be can't. said and that's right. a hard thing you hear coaches in the corner and i know you watch when you watch any event you're like he's saying you got to throw more punches or lead with the jab but how how, right. do, how is my jab going to be probing and I'm shooting them with the shotgun? I mean, right. how am I need, how do I need to deliver this? And this is a skill key thing that people don't understand when you're fighting against elite athletes, killers or mm -hmm. stylistic matchups, you got to be able to. So when I look at the Camacho fighting your dad, I see a guy who has good hands and ability in a guy like Connor, who is a good counter puncher. And can can lead, but is a natural. Floyd is a right. natural counter puncher. The thing you gotta always remember, whenever you're fighting a guy who sets bait, is that you gotta be first in setting the traps. That does not always mean be first throwing the punch. Right. Not this is key. You never allow him to have calmness. That's where they permeate. So you mm -hmm. always have to. Don't worry about connect percentage. You just keep a something going. You I'm don't even thinking. be just yeah. And I know you know you are from a lineage, so thinking the, the people don't understand how important that is. 
when you don't allow the guy to get in his comfort zone, because I can tell in the first round, early in the first round, if the dude is going to lose that fight that night outside of a hook coming and getting clipped, the mannerism in which you don't let him get into his comfort zone. Right. And even right. if it looks ugly, don't let him get there. And it's hard to explain to people how to develop that skill. First, you got to be in it. You got to mm -hmm. be in those scenarios enough. And you know that. Tell me about a scenario that you were in the corner, not as a fight, but in the corner. And you was like, wow, man, this is moving. How do I tell my guy? Do you have a moment that you thought about that you said, yeah, man, that happened real fast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know what? Actually, um, one of the moments that I bring me back is is probably to Dustin's last fight. Um, mm -hmm. I had to, I had to get him in a calm sense. Yeah. Um, you could tell that he was very, very hyper. The fight wasn't getting away from him, but he was doing some things that were uncharacteristic unchar of him, but he was still getting the job done. Yeah. So when the bell rang, we uh, I could tell that he was having fun. So immediately when he sat down, I gave him about 10 seconds to let him process, yeah. you know, what had just happened before, mm -hmm. you know, let him get some water before I go ahead and throw information at him. And um, to put him back in the mindset of being in the gym, because that's that's where we're most comfortable, right? We're most comfortable yeah. in the gym. Well, I asked him, I said, are you having fun? And he says, I'm having a blast. I'm like, okay, so I know I, I got your attention now. Now we can talk. But look, I need you to move your head a little bit more. I need a little mm -hmm. bit more offense from you. I need you to lead with your jab a little bit more. Yeah. You know, now I know that I have his attention with a little humor. Mm -hmm. Now I know he's able, and in, in, in his response, I know I was able to, you know, transfer information to him and know that it would be received Yeah. in a way, in a manner that it needed to be received. Yeah, see? And we were able to have a conversation in the middle of the round. Like, you know, what do you, what do you think you need to do more? Okay, I need to get on my feet a little bit more. I need to, I need to move a little side to side, a little head movement. I need to leave my jab a little more. And, I, you know, I would just confirm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. get behind your stick. You know, you're jabbing. Mm -hmm. You land that left hand. He's southpaw. So we're looking to land that left hand. Mm -hmm. He's like, all right, I got you. And Muscle then, memory. Out there. And he handles business. Things that you do in camp that you know the muscle memory is there. You can call right. for it. That was brilliant. And for those of you who will be watching this and understanding that, no, that's not a skill that you acquire naturally. That takes reps. And I always tell anybody, if you are training people, coaching people, be around people who've done it for a much longer time. If not, you're going to have to learn everything the hard way. And that's right. why it's so great to have a box and lineage to pull from that suitcase that you're going to need out of that treasure chest to make sure that you have and your fighter doesn't Listen, be the man, there, reason. Yeah. There's been times where I came back to the corner with my dad. He didn't say a word. And I got, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, you got, got the my, message. I got my mouthpiece rinsed out, but yeah. I got the, you know, just by, just by the look on his face. Unacceptable. Yeah. You know, and you know, all right, go out there and use your feet a little bit more, you know, a little bit more feints, more jabs. And this was out say without saying a word. And I went yeah. out there and got it done. Man, that's a powerful thing. And you know what? That's called osmosis. <laughs> Transferring it like indeed. Getting the message without unacceptable. Right. <laughs> Don't even exactly. trip. You know what we do. That's yeah. a powerful thing. Now, now as I hop in and create one more last buzz before we get it popping for the second little 10 minute closeout. I want to make sure that our special uh, shout outs go out to these particular two individuals. Harper, man, how are you? Um, listen over here from, uh, from team, team diamond. Uh, we're looking to get the job done on Saturday and we appreciate all your well wishes, man. Ah, uh, now it's the shout out segment. So all of you out here in uh, the world of combat watching live, make sure that you raise your hand. Let us know where you're from. And we're about to give you a couple of shout outs. My man, here we go. What's going on, Carson? This is Daya Davis here. Uh, Dustin, Dustin Poirier's boxing coach. I just want to send a shout out to you. What's up, man? I hope you're doing well. All right. Keep watching. I hope that was really interesting to you guys because 
as we alluded to in the conversation, as you see, we talked about being in legendary training camps and learning. And this segment here is for the trainers, meaning those who are coming into the sport and you need to know things and there are things you need to know. And some of you question and want to know kind of the lineage of what we did and how we got to this point where we came up through extensive high level competitive camps and you learn so much and a lot of you are trying to figure this thing out on your own and you can't because i'm gonna explain something to you at the at the earlier stages of this thing i got an opportunity to get baptized head in the water i mean flame lit face getting burnt when it comes down to certain things in this sport you got to learn that it's best to have guidance and stuff so explain something to you right now when we were coming up it was very very hard it was very tough and when people came to our dome they sometimes didn't really understand the depths of what they were in for so they would come in like some of you out there a little more delusional and they would walk through the doors and i'd kindly introduce people point people out who was who and who was there a young man came down from from um i think it was um miami but he was by way of somewhere like by barbados he was an uh not an olympian but he was a, a national champion amateur and i i would point the guys out to the gym when because when you walk through our doors i'm gonna do this and this was a typical tuesday you see that guy over there that dude's been the fastest running man for the last two decades. This guy over here, oh yeah, and he is gold medal surrounded. You see that dude over there? That dude over there, he's a gold medal Olympian, heavyweight. That guy also just had fight of the year with Evander Holyfield. Oh, that rusty knuckle cat right here, that dude right there, he knocked Lennox Lewis out unconscious for the world championship title yeah that girl she just won medal gold medal with a bum knee that cat over there is the top ranked amateur in the entire world that's what a typical tuesday this dude just left from the crunk gym because he needed to get much more in depth in his technique he wanted to learn more it's constant that's the layering that we were under that was a typical tuesday marion jones justin gatlin sean crawford melissa barber ray mercer oliver mccall hasim rockman john hagler killers everywhere julius fogel rashad holloway it was loaded i mean around the 2004 olympic coach coaches coming from all over coach kenny adams i mean the lineage in which i was exposed to from the gate straight out of the door with the collar around my neck i can't explain to you what that means and how that impacts a fighter so when you see fights of this magnitude those who are in and behind these type fighters have come from such a deep 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 lineage and as you heard him speak specifically to it it's just kind of what it is man and what we're doing with the next generation like he's doing for dustin and i'm doing for you guys out there who who decided to follow master boxing that was a typical day in master boxing waking up brush your teeth Go to the gym, nothing but heavy hitters. All right. So, you know, you don't get here just by posting videos. You get here by earning your stripes. And it takes a long time to earn your stripes. I'm 35 years into the sport of boxing. All right. So, that's kind of where you feel and see those wrinkles and stuff being added. When you look at Daya, this, this young man has been a champion. You got guys who think they can just walk into this game. This guy's fight father was the top 
amateur fighter in the toughest year of competition in the Olympics ever. Now, in this section, what we're going to do is we take a little three to five minute segment and we create a round and this is called styles make fights. So this is kind of where I break down the fight science and do film study type conversation with my audience. So you understand when you have a style matchup like Conor McGregor and Dustin Poirier, who's become a heck of a striker and Conor McGregor, who's already been in the ring with the likes of Floyd Mayweather and Nate Diaz, two of the more elite level boxers in their kind of sport. And with that being said, how you match these guys up, as you see earlier, I alluded to Camacho, Hector Camacho, who actually was another one of the people that came to our gym and we had to put work in on him, uh, younger fighters, but he was at the end of his career. So I won't get into that because that's neither here nor there. Rest in peace, Hector Camacho, one of the greatest to ever do it at lightweight, fast hands, powerful punches punched in combination he was an entire savage package when you have that kind of guy he also has the same cachet as as conor mcgregor very brash very bold loud makes the noise but delivers and that's what you're still facing and dia davis's father howard davis matched up against him mr davis was calm cool collected under pressure could box his lights out and came up short in a fight against the Camacho. But the same kind of narrative where you have guys like those two. One is very cool and calm. One is very brash, loud, outspoken. This is exactly the same type of fight. Dustin's very cool, level-headed. When it comes down to it, you got to really think about what does it take to beat a fighter like that. So I have like 90 seconds to explain. When you got a guy like a Conor McGregor, who's a natural counterpuncher, he hits very hard. His de the dexterity in his bones are really what gives him the necessary power. That's why guys that are in his weight class have a very hard time dealing with him because he's very heavy bone. And I speak to bone density and body dexterity and that's one of the things that conor mcgregor has he's really fighting 15 to 20 pounds naturally over his if you're the same weight as him you're not going to really have a good chance that's why he's knocked everybody out the way he has what you have to do with a guy like that is not allow him to get that power into play because he doesn't waste punches he's very very economical with the way he punches so how you got to get into a guy's system like that is you have to be able to simplify when you're in the corner one sentence all right and then re-encouragement that's it anything more than that it goes right out as goes right in one ear and out the other when you got a conor mcgregor no matter what you have to do to prevent him from getting going staying circle and constantly and throwing at him, keeping him blinded, setting traps, drawing him in, making him come and making him miss and get a little more anxious and make him pay, peck and poke around, whether it's short kicks, whether it's jabs, flutter, fluttering punches. And I used to say peck and poke, run little flurries, not just to, not just to connect. Your objective is to keep him from getting going. Keep him from trying to set traps for you. So you have to pull him to you, circle him. So he cannot get those kicks off that he's been working on because that's what he used in the first fight. If it if it's not broke, don't fix it. And then the thing you got to keep in mind is the moment you allow him to get into the fight he wants, that's when you're working against the grain. So the objectivity the objective is to keep him turning, to keep him flustered, and to make the fight ugly. So when you get past the round in which you had gotten knocked out in, you realize you're in the second. You realize you're in the third. You're in a more comfortable place for you to start the fight. 
And that's one of the key things in any major fight, rematches. Whenever the outcome the first time was bad, that's what you have to do. You have to keep them off balance, period. Because the minute someone like Connor, because he's going to strike, he's setting up the entire time to strike. There's not a lot of techniques and skills that you have to accrue. Your objective is to do the thing that's necessary. Fight an ugly fight so he can't make it a pretty victory. And once he's out of that zone and he's into a more frustrated zone, that's when you start to strike with purpose. And that's kind of it. You keep it simple. And every time your fighter gets there and comes to the corner, your objective is to just keep him calm, keep him cool, and let him know everything's going to be fine even if he comes back banged up. But you make sure you pull that other thing out of him before he gets ready to leave that corner because it's super important. And that's how you do it, people. Combat is extremely, extremely about repetition. Once and for all. Repetition, repetition, muscle memory, repetition. And that's what it is. And that's the sector. So take that with you. If you guys are out there coaching guys, remember one thing. Strategy is everything. And over here at Master Boxing, we got the book of knowledge when it comes down to it. Four decades in the game, man. It really pays off. And to have and be around people who've been in there involved much longer than you is the key to learn and longevity prosperity. That is styles make fight round. All right. So bar none, man learn and that's what we're here to do at master boxing so for those of you who have never understood what we were the fiber in which we came from make sure you stick around and continue to follow us if you got to subscribe subscribe if you got to like the page like the page but i tell you what if you about that combat life you need to be on the right page and this book has the right pages so i hope you guys uh enjoy the fight because it's lit up right here Put it down. Who you pulling for? Let me know where you from. If you a trainer, holler at us. Make sure that you continue to follow Master Boxing across the boards. This is the fight show, and I'm just your host, Eric A. Bradley. Be sure to subscribe if you want to see this entire show in its entirety because it was fire. We had some great conversation. Special shouts out to Daya Davis for coming on board. Special shouts out to Conan Silviera, former world champion UFC fighter and head co-founder of American Top Team. Be sure to watch that one next week as we jump in with the big head honcho, Conan Silviera. Until next time, be blessed at Godspeed. Coach Eric A. Bradley signing out. Peace. Let's get it. UFC 257. It's about to go down. Salute. Wasn't just a an Olympic teammate of mine. He was my dear friend. Who's gone too soon. Um, what I remember most about Howard is that some of the conversations we had together. Not about boxing. It was more so about life and about friends and family members. Howard, you're special. You've always been special. And one thing I want to say to you is that I will miss you, but you will not be forgotten. God bless you, brother. And by the way, you know what? You gave me a black eye during training camp. And now, looking back on that, especially now, I cherish that black eye. And I don't cherish black eyes. I miss you, brother. I miss you. And you will be missed. God bless.